Now, this little talk is specifically about telling stories. Uh, and one of the reasons I wanted to sort of raise the challenge and the use of Storify and things is because I wanted people to start thinking about how we tell stories and how we use the sorts of material that we get in, in different ways. Because, you know, in the end, I think it would be really a, a terrible waste if all we ended up with out of this project was a database. You know, another database, another set of names. Um, I mean, I talk a lot about making things, for example, machine readable. Making, uh, giving machines access to data, structuring the data in useful ways. But the whole point of that, of course, is to create some space within which we can make human connections. It's all about thinking about the, 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 uh, the stories that are there, the emotions that they raise, the ways we can put these together and, and tell uh, stories which actually take us somewhere different. So, I mean, what I want to see, what I'd like to see come out of this project is really as a platform for telling those sorts of stories. So not just the list of names, not just the database. Um, I was thinking about this, well, it's about a year ago now, uh, when I gave a, a talk to um, the Australian New Zealand Society of Indexes. <coughs> Which may seem like I want to give you a talk, but they were a fantastic audience. Um, oops, that's not what I wanted. Um, What I wanted to do in that uh, talk was to try and start assembling the sorts of fragments that we've been talking about today um, and looking at ways that they could be sort of brought together <coughs> into some sort of story which, which took you somewhere, made you feel something, but also um, embedded some structures within it so it could be interrogated and used in different ways. So uh, this is the presentation that's on my, on my blog site. Um, and this is what we actually saw on the day. Um, with me. So I started off from where we were within that particular room uh, and started looking at some connections and where they might take us. I'm not going to go through the whole thing, obviously. But I will point out that I did use uh, Alexander Kelly, uh, the, the person referenced in that diary fragment this morning, as an example there. This is a photo of the hostel where he spent all of his life after the war. Uh, uh, it was actually quite close to the venue where I was giving this talk. So there was a spatial connection as well. Um, um, the bed that was used in that hostel was actually in the collection of the Australian War Memorial. Um, I uh, found his death notice in Trove um, and found a, a photograph, uh, well there was a photograph attached to his record scrapbook in mapping our Anzacs of his memorial park, which is in the Springvale Crematorium, in fact not very far from where my own, the remains of my own grandparents are. Again, connections, uh, layers. Um, and that's his service record, and then, of course, is that diary fragment. I'm just going to skip forward a bit because I want to show you another example that I used. Um, okay. So, this is the service record of Charles Allen. Charles has a very different story. Charles enlisted three times and was medically discharged each time and had a problem with his ankle. If you look at the service record, you can find things like, for example, he had a tattoo. Said Maud Gordon. Maud was his girlfriend and later his wife. You can see that in Mapping Our Ancestors. There's Maud down there as his next of kin. <coughs> Charles survived the war, obviously, because he didn't serve overseas, but unfortunately he wasn't so lucky in peace. I mean, he was killed in a coral accident uh, in Sydney in 1938. Now, we actually know quite a lot about the early life of Charles Allen. Um, why? Because Charles's father was Chinese. Charles was therefore considered to be half caste, and his uh, activities were controlled by under the white trade policy. <coughs> um, and there are in the National Archives of Australia many, many thousands of records which document the workings of the white trade policy. That's Charles in 1908. Where's that photo from? It's from a certificate which he needed if he was going to get back into the country after travelling overseas. He travelled with his father to China in 1908. Uh, in order to be exempted from the dictation test on his return, he needed to have the certificate. Without it, the dictation test would be applied, and the dictation test was just used to exclude people. 
There are many, many thousands of these certificates in the National Archives of Australia. They are among, amongst the most compelling documents you will ever see. And I always get a bit emotional. But anyway, um, <coughs> they have the photographs on the front and on the backs, they have handprints. They are an amazing resource, and um, with my partner, Kate Bagman, who's there, who's a historian of Chinese Australia, we're trying to sort of bring this material out. Um, and we've got a project called Invisible Australians, which is aiming just to do that. Um, and I want to introduce this because um, the sort of questions that I'm grappling with in terms of Invisible Australians are similar to the sorts of ones that we'll be dealing with in, in the, the Building Our Bit project. It's those questions about um, representation. How we, how we present people's lives in a way that they're not just bits of data. And that we create some space around them so that we know they are people. Even if we only have very small information about them, we know that they have a life. And that it's, that, that's out there somewhere even if it's not knowable. You know, I think there are questions about design and uh, interface uh, creation that, that enable us to work on these sorts of questions in interesting ways. So, Thinking about this, um, and in fact, after my talk to the, the indexes, they were uh, really enthusiastic about invisible Australians, and I went away and did a bit of an experiment. <coughs> uh, and I created this. Um, this will just keep scrolling and scrolling and scrolling and scrolling. There's about 7,000 images in it at the moment, and that's just drawn from one series in the National Archives of Australia. There are many more series which we get to add. These photos, like that photo of Charles Allen, come from the certificates presenting them from dictation testing. You can actually view that context clicking on them. <coughs> there's the certificate, and there's a link down there which will actually take you into record search, the National Archives database, if you want to actually look at the context within the, uh, the, the, the record, the, the descriptive system itself. It's, it's something which is quite compelling, again, also quite challenging. I am quite discomforting in some ways to be confronted by that gaze, to be challenged by the gaze of these people who were uh, subjected to the restrictions of the white Australian policy. And I've had people email me saying they're in tears scrolling through the wall of faces. So, what this makes me think is that, um, you know, when we start to think about how we represent this material, how we start to tell these stories online, the sorts of interfaces we develop. We shouldn't be hung up on making everything easy. That there is actually some. Uh, there's a role for complexity and ambiguity as we develop these sorts of resources. Um, and it seems to me that the greatest respect we can show these people, or the people who are going to be in doing our bit, the greatest respect we can show them is really a readiness to use our own brains, to actually see beyond what's there on the page, to imagine, to connect to see the possibilities to know that there is that life there. Now, there are some interesting tools being developed, again, uh, which enable us to start to take a, a, a more subtle and, a, and experimental approach to narrative and stories and the way we do that online. And a, a one which was been just recently uh, released is a thing called Neatline. Um, Neatline... Uh, is actually built on top of another system called a mecca. A mecca is a way of managing collections and developing exhibitions online. Again, it's free, it's open source, it's developed by the same people who developed the terror. Um, so you can download it and you can use it. There's actually a, a, a site where you can set up a free account online to play with a mecca and to use it. Neatline is a plugin for a mecca. Uh, one great thing about uh, you know, open source software is that other people can contribute to it in, in innovative ways. So in this case, instead of building a new system from scratch, they've taken what was there in a mecca, in a, an ability to manage collections, <coughs> and they've built a whole new way of seeing that collection on top of it, using creating a plugin. It's going to be hard for me to do justice to what Neatline actually enables you to do, and I invite you to go. We've got this great site here which just gives you some examples, uh, and it's worth exploring in some detail. Um, but what it does is it really starts to play around with ideas of time and space and, and how we represent them and how we start to tell stories. This, for example, um, takes a letter from a, a draftsman in the Civil War, um, which he wrote to his daughter. Uh, and within that letter, he actually includes a, a sketch map of a battle. 
And so what we've got here is the actual letter. Um, we've got the, uh, the sketch map actually overlaid on the geographical features of the time. And we've got various elements within the letters highlighted where he talks about particular places or things. Um, so you can actually you can read it as a story. There's, you see, if you see those numbers there, they actually take you through a sort of narrative about the whole thing. But you can actually explore bits of the letters. You can see the connection between the letter and the place. You can actually follow the progress of the battle uh, in different forms, both in his map, overlaid on his map, and also on the, the, the base map underneath. Um, so you get this really interesting conjunction of the landscape as it was experienced and known by that person in that, that space and how he was communicating it to his daughter. Uh, and you get that overlaid on the, the, the geographic coordinates. Um, and there are, there are other tools built into Netline which are really interesting, like uh, if you're entering a date, for example, they have an ambiguity slider. So you have a <coughs> tool which enables you to indicate sort of the ambiguity around a particular date. Um, and, as I, and as you can see here, they're playing with the idea of space and how it's represented. And there's another great example uh, This one, which I won't, I won't go into, but you can do that yourself because it's, it's wonderful. Which takes a, a, the work of a, a schoolgirl where she started to develop her maps of various uh, um, states within the US. Um, but they have uh, certain aesthetic and uh, idealised dimensions to them in her work. And those drawings are overlaid on the actual geographic representation. So you see the connection between this girl and how she was imagining and, and what was significant to her overlaid on the coordinates. So really nice dialogue between, again, the experience and the, and the geography. So, and, and I think there's some real opportunities for using things like Neatline as a storytelling tool. You can actually uh, you know, have uh, the episodes going through time, you can have them related both through time and space, and you can have those layers of ambiguity there, uh, which I think are really important. So why couldn't we, for example, uh, develop a way of feeding data from doing our bit into something like Neatline? There's no reason why we can't. It's all open source again. We can provide our data in such a way so it could be pulled in quite easily so somebody developing a neat line site could use it and start to develop these sorts of complex narratives. It's all possible. Um, now, in thinking about this sort of stuff, I, I, I'll go back to a, a quote by Greg Denning, and I'm going to read it out. Um, Greg Denning, the, the historian. Nothing can be returned to the past, not life to its dead, not justice to its victimised. But we can take something from the past with our hindsighted clarity. That which we take, we can return. We disempower the people of the past when we rob them of their present moments. We dehumanise them, make them our puppets. We owe them more, it seems to me. So, why that moves me and, and, and makes me confronts me as a historian is, and as a, a developer of websites is that we've got to find better ways of giving the people in the past back their present moments online. And so that means exploring or making people aware of the contexts of this material so that uh, you know the way we design material, the way we present it, when you're presenting a document, being able to show those rich links and context so that you know it's part of a story and it's not just an isolated artifact in itself. <coughs> so it's about interfaces, it's about designs, it's about tools, and they're things which we should always be thinking about, how we actually use them, what we can do, challenging the boundaries, challenging our assumptions about how we present this material because it's all up for grabs. We're in a really exciting time. Like I said, there are great tools coming out. There are all sorts of resources being made available in digital form. We can, we can uh, you know, imagine a project like this doing our bit, and we can see how we can assemble the information. So it's a, it's a great time to be thinking about how we can actually go that step further and, and create these spaces where we can see these lives and imagine these lives. We want to look beyond the document, look beyond the data, look beyond these fragments, and really see the people inside. And I just wanted to, at this point, share my own little storefly, which is about um, something I created recently. Um, I was, uh, you saw how I, well, I, I didn't say in terms of the wall of faces, that used a, a what I did there was download all the images of the certificates and then ran a facial detection script over it, which actually looked for the faces mm -hmm. on that image, and I was able then to crop them out. I was thinking about this recently, and about all the faces, and thinking, you know, wouldn't it be interesting to go the other way? So instead of pulling the faces out of record search and showing them on the wall, if we could actually show the faces inside record search, 
what would that do to an archival folding aid? So I did it. Again, I created a little user script. Uh, and we go, let's actually show an example. This is the user script. Um, go into, it's only for this series, it's the 84 slash one at the moment. How does that make you think about archives? Does it change your way you view the folding aid? If we look at the, uh, why don't you look at the, the file in detail? Oops, no, it's not that. I can't just say. So that's the contents of that file. There are people inside. <coughs> so. These are the sorts of things which we can be thinking about as we develop this project. So, with that in mind, I'm going to send you off again to your groups. Now, is anybody, uh, you're happy to go back to the groups you're working on, you've still got stuff to do, or do you want to, uh, if there's something come up which you would like to, if there's a topic which you'd like to explore? Happy to all go off back into your groups? Yeah, okay. Well, maybe we'll sign up. Okay, so let's say uh, just over an hour and a half, back here at sort of 3.15. Um, does that sound okay? Okay, thanks everybody.